Good evening, everybody. So nice to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Dr. Megan Williams. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm the Assistant Director of Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity here at KU. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our 2021 Jenna Mackey Distinguished Lecture featuring Dr. Sarah Deer. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here tonight on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Ka, Osage, and Shawnee peoples, and to recognize the sovereign, sovereignty of the four federally recognized tribes of Kansas, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo in Kansas, the Sac and Fox of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska, and the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. We would also like to express our solidarity with the Lawrence Indigenous community. Um, we want to thank the First Nations Student Association, as well as Jana's campaign and the KU Bookstore for their co-sponsorship. The bookstore is selling copies of Dr. Deer's The Beginning and End of Rape at a 20% discount, um, and we'll host a book signing following the lecture. We'd also like to thank um, the Care Center for being here and having information uh, for those who may need it. Um, and also a note that tonight's lecture is being recorded and will be available on Emily Taylor Center's uh, YouTube channel. Um, so make sure to let folks know who wanted to be here but couldn't that they can see it there. Um, now I'd like to welcome Jana Mackey's parents, Drs. Christy and Kurt Brungard, to speak on Jana's life and legacy. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I'm Christy Brungart, and I'm Jana Mackey's mother. And if you uh, are here and don't know anything about Jana, I'm the one to tell you. And so I want to first start by telling you that um, Jana was actually born in the middle of a wheat field in south central Kansas. And when she was five years old, we moved to Hayes, Kansas, and she ended up going all through uh, her senior year in high school in Hayes, Kansas. And Jana actually um, died in, 20, in 2008, and she was 25 years old. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit, but I want to tell you first a little bit about her life, because I always hate to tell you about that horrible part if you don't know anything about her life, because she was really cool. And so Jana was a pretty good singer. In fact, she was a really good singer. And in fact, when KU said, Jana, if you will come to KU and be in our vocal music program, we'll pay a whole bunch of your tuition. And mom said, yes, you want to go there. And the good news is she did want to go here. And in fact, it is the only place that she ever wanted to go. And in fact, it's the only campus visit we did. And so it all just worked out great. So Jana came to KU and life was great. And we could come watch her sing still, and we loved that because she was really, really good. And so, of course, people were like, you know, in awe, and we were just like, oh. And then about halfway... Let me, th let me interrupt. Uh, you can tell we're married. Uh, what we really loved, more than watching Janice sing, was watching people watch Janice sing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you're a parent, you get that. And so... And Jana was six foot tall, and she had a big presence and a big mouth and a great big voice. And so you couldn't help but see her. And so we, we loved that part. And then about halfway through her sophomore year, she called me one day, and she said, Mom, I'm sick of singing. And I said, oh, no, you're not. She's like, Mom, I am. I, I, I'm tired of it. I said, Jana, but you're so good at it. She said, I know, I am. But it's not my passion. She said, you know, those darn gen eds they make you take? I took a class in women's studies, and that is my passion. I'm changing my major. Now, at that time, I was not teaching at Fort Hay State, and I was not advising other people's children. So when I tell you this next part, you're going to have to forgive me. I said, no, you're not changing your major. She said, Mom, I already did. <laughs> she knew. She knew her mom. So she changes her major, she graduated, still graduated in four years, and got a degree in, in women's studies, and then worked for the next year and a half or so on a couple of political campaigns, of course, both for women, because this was her thing now. 
And she did that, and then she got a job as a lobbyist at the Kansas State Capitol. So she was one of the youngest lobbyists at the Kansas State Capitol. She was also the best singer of the lobbyists at the Kansas State Capitol. And she did that for three years, and she called me one day, and she said, you know, Mom, I'm never going to be the best advocate for women I can be without a legal education. I need to go to law school. I'm like, law school? Well, where all are you going to apply? She's like, well, Mom, KU Law School. I said, well, where else? She said, well, I just need to get in there because that's the only place I want to go. Thankfully, she did. So she came here to KU Law School, and the whole time she'd been doing that, all those years here in Lawrence, she actually had worked at that time. It was called the, when she started, it was called the Rape Crisis Center. It was even before Gadigi. Tell me that again. RVSS. When she started volunteering there, that's what it was called. She also did some volunteering at the Willow, which all of that makes, ends up making this story even more ironic. But um, she was doing that for several years. Actually, she just quit that volunteering her first year at law school. She's like, Mom, this, this law, law school thing is hard for me. I'm going to need to really focus. And so she had just completed her first year at KU Law School, and she called me one night, and she said, you know, Mom, so she'd been dating this guy for about a year. We thought we knew him well. We'd been to his house. He'd been to our house. But she called me right after her first year of law school, and she said, you know, Mom, I think I'm going to have to break up with him. I said, oh, really? What's going on? And she's like, this is really weird. She said, he just, he texts me all the time. He calls me all the time. If I don't answer him immediately, he gets so mad. She said, he acts like he thinks he owns me. And she said, he's, he's just insanely jealous anymore. She's like, I just, I don't know what's going on. But she said, I even feel like wherever I go next, there he is. I think he's stalking me. Well, of course, keep in mind, this would have been in 2008. Not everybody had their phones with them like they do now. So stalking then, stalking now looked quite a bit different. Then he was physically stalking her. Well, so she called and told me all that, and I said... Probably the dumbest thing I could have ever said to her, but I didn't know that I didn't know at that time because I knew nothing about anything to do with any type of gender and relationship violence. And I said what I think a lot of parents would say. I said, well, break up with him. And she did. And three weeks later, he murdered her right here on Michigan Street in Lawrence, Kansas. I'm sure I see some nods. Some of you are remembering it. And... Wow, it's been quite a while since I've told that story, so struggling with that just a little bit. So he killed her. And when I tell that story, you know, I think, sometimes I think the first thing in people's minds is what happened to him. And so I always like to go ahead and tell you the rest of the story about what did happen to him so you don't have to be wondering. He actually got in his vehicle headed east, the Lawrence Police Department we, we were in Lawrence by the time they found her, and so we knew. We, 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 they called us and said they were on their way east because they felt like he was on his way to the east coast. They'd found a connection in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and they felt like that's where he was on his way to. And so they followed him there, and they found him, and sure enough, and they, they put him in jail. They, they found him and put him in jail, and his first night in jail, he hung himself with his own jeans. And as nice as I can say it, we were done with him. And so that's the story of what happened to Jana. And that's the story kind of about her, her life and about her death. And Kurt's going to talk a little bit about what we did then. Um, I think six hours after Jana's death, we were driving the streets of Lawrence, Kansas, in shock, as you can imagine. And I remember at the intersection of, of uh, Iowa and, uh, is that 23rd Street, that major intersection? I remember being at that intersection and turned into Christie and said, you know, Jana didn't die in a car wreck. Jana died a martyr for a cause. Think about what she had done in her young adult life. And she died the same way that she had worked so hard to prevent women from being harmed. And it was that six hours after Jana's death that we decided we were going to do something. And 18 months later, we kicked off an organization called Jana's Campaign and never turned back. And, and uh, 
Today, Jazz Campaign is an education prevention organization that works to reduce gender and relationship violence. We've worked in 48 states and a number of foreign countries, and um, we're housed in Horton, Kansas, and in Hayes, Kansas, but our work throughout, we have conferences in Chicago, to Houston, to, to uh, Dallas, to you name it, we're all over the country doing work, and all because in Jana's name. And uh, anyway, I, before I'm done, I, I, and I want to thank KU for this, they started this, Kathy Rose Markery started this uh, lecture series along with the committee of some of us, and I want to thank KU for, for doing this and, and uh, talking about causes that are important to us and are important to Jana. Uh, a couple of our, we have one board member, Michelle McCormick is here. Michelle's our past president, and Michelle's a past president and on our board, and we have, um, Evelyn, there she is, Evelyn Doobie. She's one of our staff members on our staff at Janice Campaign. So uh, anyway, oh, we have, oh, it's not working. Okay, we have an eight by 10 glossy of myself they were gonna post. Oh, it was Jana, I'm sorry, okay. Anyway, thanks KU for continuing to do this work that's important and continue to invite Christy and I uh, to be part of it. So thank you. Um, before we go, and, and I know we're out of time, but I just want to say, and um, I, I'm sure, I'm hoping that some of you have been to some of these in the past, but over the years, KU has done an amazing job, and every year they bring in such amazing speakers, and this has meant so much to us and to our family because Jana was very active on this campus. I'm seeing some nods back here. Did anybody here know Jana? Oh my goodness, wow. I just always love it when people actually knew Jana. But you can vouch for me. She was a very active young woman and she worked on causes that really matter. And to us, this kind of education, this kind of program really matters. And so this seems really Jana-ish to me. So I really appreciate KU doing this. And Jen, thank you so much for making it happen for another year. Thank you so much to the Brungarts for being here. Um, it's always very moving to hear them speak about Jana. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Tweezna Rose Mills to introduce Dr. Sarah Deer. Tweezna is an indigenous storyteller from the Shoshone, Yakima, and the Umatilla nations of Wyoming, Washington, and Oregon. Um, she's a co-chair of the First Nations Student Students Association. Um, as well as a second, uh, she's earning her second master's in the Department of Film and Media Studies at the University of Kansas to help convey histories and stories from an indigenous perspective. So please help me in welcoming Tweesna. Hello. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Sarah Deer is a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma and a university distinguished professor at the University of Kansas. Her 2015 book, The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America, is the accumulation of over 25 years of working with survivors and has received several awards, including the Best First Book Award from the Native American Indigenous Studies Association, a, law uh, oh, yep, a lawyer by training, <clears throat> but an advocate in practice. Dr. Deer's scholarship focuses, focuses on the intersection of federal Indian law and victims' rights using indigenous feminist principles as a framework. Dr. Deer is a co-author of four textbooks on tribal law and has been published in a wide variety of, of law journals, including the Harvard Journal Law and Gender, the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism, and the Columbia Journal of Gender and Law. Her work to end violence against Native women has received national awards from the American Bar Association and the Department of Justice. She has testified before Congress on four occasions regarding violence against Native women and was appointed by Attorney General Eric Holder to chair a federal adv advisory committee on sexual violence in Indian country. Dr. Deer was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 2014. In 2017, Dr. Deer 
was inducted into the KU Women's Hall of Fame, and in 2019, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She currently teaches here at the University of Kansas, her alma mater, where she holds a joint appointment in Women, Gender, and Sexual Studies and the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Dr. Deer is also the Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Deer. Um, this is kind of surreal for me because I've been on sabbatical, so I haven't been in a classroom since March of 2020. Um, and I've certainly not lectured, and I still have this mask I made myself when we couldn't buy any, because I've been on sabbatical and sitting in my home writing for a year and a half. So this is very surreal to me. I mean, I've been outside my house. <laughs> um, but, um, but being in a, a, a room like this is something that's, I don't, I'm worried I'm not going to recognize people and offend them, so <laughs> I don't recognize your eyes. Feel free to tell me your name. Um, I uh, had a chance to sit down with a, a friend yesterday, Sarah Jane Russell, who was the director of RVSS um, when I became a student here. And um, I think that Jana and I would have been really, really good friends. Um, I transferred to KU as a junior undergraduate in 1993. When I came to KU, my major was theater. Um, I loved acting, but I didn't sing. I couldn't be in a musicals because I'm tone deaf. But, um, but I was a theater major, which just really got under my father's skin. Um, he was a lawyer, and he said, you know, actors have the highest unemployment rate of any profession in the United States. Um, <clears throat> but um, I didn't get cast in anything when I got here. So <laughs> I decided to follow what I also was very passionate about, which was philosophy. So I majored in philosophy and in women's studies, and it's great to teach in the very department that sort of created who I am today. And then after I finished my undergraduate degree, I went right into KU Law, which was the plan, um, since I wasn't going to be an actor anymore. But, you know, the courtroom is sort of a theater <laughs> of itself, right? So I talked to Sarah Jane, and, and um, I also volunteered for RVSS when I was an undergraduate and a law student here at KU. Um, it's probably the best education I ever received um, outside the classroom in terms of respecting dignity and autonomy for survivors of violence and for victims of violence as well. So thank you very much for bringing me here. Um, actually, I just live about a quarter mile up the road, but um, my husband dropped me off. <laughs> Lazy. Um, so um, I want to take you through a journey this, uh, this evening um, of my work and some of the things that we need to know we need to work on. Some of my um, talk contains some troubling information, um, and so I'm really glad that we have the care center here. If you find that it's bringing up emotions, feelings, memories, and you need to process those, there are people here um, who can put you in touch with folks that can talk to you about it. I also want to let you know that you don't need to take frantic notes. I'm always happy to share my PowerPoints with anyone. Um, please don't miss you. I mean, just use them, you know, you don't need to take notes, just use my slides um, if you need to, and um, ho hopefully everything is cited correctly so you can go to the original source um, should you need to. Um, so one of the things that's really, really challenging about talking about violence in Indian country is that it's very, di it's very dismal. It's, it's, a, it's a very serious problem, and um, it tends to then, what happens a lot when I talk about sexual violence in Indian country is it turns really into people feeling very sorry for Indians. Um, and so I wanna try to tell you the truth but also leave you with the resilience of Indian people and the way in which Native people have survived and have helped their own, their own victims, victims within their tribal communities find healing and justice. So I'll start out, as I said, with the facts. Um, it's very, very difficult to get national data about violence in Indian country. Um, and that's because Native people make up such a small percentage of the United States pop population that it's very difficult to get what quantitative scholars call a statistically significant sample. It's very challenging to be able to study this issue. The other thing that happens is that there are over 570 federally recognized tribes in the United States. And every tribe is different with their own history, their own culture, um, and so it's very difficult to sort of make grand generalizations. So to the extent that 
I don't have time to go over 574 different tribal governments, uh, I will be making some generalizations in my talk today. But the best data that we have is starting to be a little dated now, but it came out in May of 2016, and it's a report, it's a federally funded report from the National Institute of Justice. And they did get a statistically significant number of native respondents to their annual victimization survey, and so we're able to draw some conclusions. <clears throat> so here is what the, um, the official numbers for the federal government are, and you can see here that um, over 84% of native women um, experience some form of violence in their lifetime, with over half of Native women experiencing some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. So it's more common than not for a Native person to be victimized by um, sexual violence. And, and that's why one of my good friends, I just noticed I have lipstick all over the inside of my mask. I don't know what I look like. Um, but, uh, but she wrote um, a, a manual for, for young Native teens on, on a reservation, and it said what to do when you're raped. So it was a, a booklet for, for young people, an educational booklet, not if, but when. Um, so the other interesting thing to note about this data is really interesting. Um, typically, criminologists talk about interracial and intraracial crime. So if you are a white victim, statistically, you're most likely to have a perpetrator who's also white. And for most races, that stays the same. But the exception to that is Native people. Native people report in these victimization surveys that it's actually more common than, than not to be victimized by someone who is not Native. So it's an anomaly in, in criminology from, to that, um, from that angle. So this shows you, for example, um, the interracial perpetrator are the top two lines here. So you can see that female victims report that 97% of their perpetrators were non-Native. Now, it's not that Native people don't hurt each other. They, we absolutely do hurt each other. That's represented here in the bottom two lines. 35% of Native women report that they've had a perpetrator who is also Native. Um, so that's sort of what we're dealing with, and I'll come back to this statistic in just a little bit. But I want to talk now about what's not in the data, because the victimization surveys that the government um, funds do not ask all of the questions that we need answers to. And one of the things that they don't ask is, or didn't ask for this particular report, is um, sexual orientation and gender identity. And so we don't know, we don't have from that data enough to tell us how the problem presents in those communities. So I wanted to talk a little bit about two-spirit identity. Um, you may not be familiar with this term, two-spirit. Uh, it's a fair, fairly recent term. It was created as a, as a call for unity among Native LGBTQ people. Um, it also represents that sexual violence, or I'm sorry, sexual identity, gender identity, and sexual orientation are sometimes fluid. Oftentimes, tribal nations have a culture of having a third gender or having gender variant people who would do different things at different times of the year. And so while two-spirit is often a shortcut um, to talk about sort of the umbrella of different sexual orientations and gender identities, it's not necessarily one that all Native people use. It's not something that necessarily fits within a particular culture. Um, you know, you might have one spirit, but that spirit is a lesbian, right? So it's not something that um, everyone uses, and it's not even something that everyone likes, but, um, but that's the shortcut that I'll be using um, uh, with apologies for, for those that it doesn't apply to. But we just don't have much data on this population, and we need it desperately. I have been able to find about four or five small studies that are um, maybe 20, 25 people. And uh, I put them up here, but we can see that if we talk about two-spirit LGBTQ Native people, we have higher rates of childhood sexual abuse, we see high rates of sexual and physical assault, and in one study, over 84% of two-spirit people reported experiencing bias-based victimization. So this is an area ripe for study. If you are a student and this is an issue that interests you, this is an area where research is desperately needed because not all victims experience crime in the same way. So let me get started by just talking now a little bit about 
pre-colonial justice. And this could be a whole semester, but it's just a slide. Um, so <laughs> we talk about, um, uh, you know, one of the challenges in doing indigenous studies is that uh, most tribes did not have a written language until the 19th century. And so all of our laws and our stories and our customs were passed down orally. And so to the extent that you're looking in the written record for information about how crime was dealt with, you may not find it. You may find anthropologists, you may find Indian agents, you may find other folks who are looking at Indians and writing about them, but you don't necessarily get a tribal perspective without doing that kind of research in the community. But there are some generalizations that we can make. The focus of many, many tribal customary traditions was restitution not to punish the offender so much as to put the victim back in control. And so from that angle, it's almost like a civil suit, right? Instead of being the state versus the perpetrator, it's the victim versus the perpetrator, which puts a victim in more, uh, more control over, over the situation at hand. Um, uh, we also had um, what we call matrilineal, matrilocal cultures. Uh, not all tribes follow this pattern, but um, for, for example, my tribal citizenship is a Muscogee Creek Nation, and it's a, ma a traditionally matrilineal. Um, and my father is my Indian side. So technically, you know, if you went by traditional law, really, truly traditional law, I couldn't identify as Muscogee. Um, so some of the folks that think about this talk about, well, you know, if the, if the lineage passes through the mother, right, and the mother becomes the central component of um, the, the family and the, the children find their identity through the mother's lineage. Um, some people have suggested this may have been sort of a built-in safety net um, and a preventative uh, aspect of culture to protect women and to hold women in the center um, of, of the family. So when I was in law school here, um, this was, <laughs> I also have to just again, think Jan and I were maybe kindred spirits at some point because um, uh, I, um, I thought I wanted to be a prosecutor. And my first day of Indian law, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Uh, I had that moment of just like epiphany, right? I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Kansas girl, uh, Wichita Northwest, class of 91, anyone? No? <laughs> um, and um, <clears throat> so I did not grow up on the reservation in Oklahoma. I didn't, I was about two hours north, but I didn't uh, grow up on a reservation. So when I got to law school and discovered Indian law and discovered the really complicated structures in Indian country for dealing with violence, I thought, that's what I want to do. And that job didn't exist, so I was really kind of struggling my third year to find a good fit for me. But during my years at KU Law, I was able to um, look a little bit more into my own tribal nation's history. Um, and I really wanted to write, there was a particular class that I had to write a long paper for, and I really wanted to write about how traditionally Muscogee people um, dealt with crimes like domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of very difficult information to get from a library. So I did the best I could, and I've used these slides. I used this slide in my law school presentation in 1998. So I'm getting a lot of mileage out of it. But <clears throat> one of the things that <clears throat> really stuck out to me and made me really proud to be a Muscogee citizen and wanted, me, wanted to learn more about, about my heritage was this passage William Bartram was this interesting kind of fellow. He was a naturalist. He drew plant life, animal life. He did a lot of the taxonomy um, or biopiracy, depending on how you want to talk about it, um, for um, the southeastern part of the United States or what would become the United States. And <clears throat> he lived among the Creek and Cherokee people for about a decade. Um, this would be down in where, where now is Alabama and Georgia to do his work. And so he got to know Creek and Cherokee people quite well. This is prior to removal, so this is before we get to Oklahoma. Um, and he remarked he had all kinds of journals and writings. He was very prolific. And he talked often about gender in the tribal cultures that he was living among, um, and often noted that they were very different from patriarchy <laughs> in that um, women were not mistreated, they weren't scolded, they weren't um, ever um, beaten, physical abuse didn't, didn't occur. And so this was like, okay, well, this gives me something really proud to be part of this culture, be a descendant of this culture. 
And so it got me more and more interested in how Creek people governed and how Creek people governed um, law. I should say Muskogee and Creek are the same thing. <laughs> Muskogee is our traditional name and Creek is the English name, so that's why it's the Muskogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. Um, so our nation was what we might call a very assimilated nation um, by the early 19th century. That means that we were largely adopting European customs, uh, clothing, language, religion, and the like. And some of that was done to protect ourselves, right? Because we were called a civilized tribe by having all of these white sort of attributes of our, our culture. Um, but we didn't have a written language um, in the early 19th century. So any laws that were passed, if they wanted to write those laws down, they would be in English, which is the primary language that um, Creek people use besides the Muscogee language. Um, we got a lot of pressure from Washington and from Indian agents to codify our laws, even though we said, well, they're orally transmitted, that means everyone has access to them. They said, no, you gotta put them in a book to be a <laughs> civilized tribe. So to satisfy the Indian agents, we certainly uh, did that. These laws were passed in Muskogee by the Creek Council uh, and then codified into a, um, a written format by, um, by the chief's son, who was the recorder of the, of the National Council. And his name was Chili Mackintosh. So <laughs> Mackintosh is a Scottish name, and we had largely intermarried with Scottish immigrants. So today, Mackintosh, McGirt, those kinds of names are very common among my tribe. Um, but they wrote down this rape law in 1824, and most of the laws, the other, there were about 50 laws that were passed in that year, and um, most of them looked very similar to Anglo-American law, so they looked like a law that you could pull from a state statute. Um, but this law was different to me because it has gender in it, um, and it seems to really center a victim in the aftermath of an assault. So, and Chili McIntosh was a very interesting character. He was also a Baptist minister, um, and, um, and the name, just Chili McIntosh. You know, the, there's so many revered names in the plains, like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, um, and Chili McIntosh is, is my, uh, my ancestor. So <clears throat> if we decide, if we think about where we are, right, the highest rates of sexual assault and domestic violence in the nation, and we think about the cultures, which really didn't allow for much of that kind of behavior to happen, how do we tell that story? What has happened between then and now to help us understand why it is? Because that's the, journalists call me every day. Why? Why is it the highest? I'm like, well, you have to look at my PowerPoint. Um, but, but, but we need to understand that. We need to understand that story so that we can do something about it because the statistics are not acceptable. The status quo is not acceptable. Um, so that's the question that I have spent my career so far trying to answer. And I use this term sovereignty, which is what I titled tonight's talk, because I think sovereignty is a concept that we don't talk enough about, both in the context of sexual violence, but also in the context of tribal nations. So I want to begin by giving you a basic definition. Um, sovereignty is something we all know about, we just don't talk about it very much. The, the state of Kansas has sovereignty. It's a government, and governments, just by being governments, have the ability to make laws and to be governed by those laws. So it's very simple, right? We just don't, we, we kind of take it for granted when it comes to states or the federal government. So we don't even use the word, right? It's just inherent in the idea of being a state or the federal government. Um, but when we talk about tribal nations, the challenge is <clears throat> we struggle every day for sovereignty. We struggle in the courts, we struggle in Congress, we struggle at home. Um, and so when we start talking about sovereignty in the context of tribal nations, it becomes much more fraught. Um, and because I was a rape crisis advocate for uh, six years while I was here in Lawrence as a student, um, I also started to think about, and I was, I was doing, I was doing um, 24 hour crisis calls even in law school, um, and I started to think about how survivors experience sexual assault and that the violation of somebody's bodily integrity, the sexual autonomy of an individual person, 
is an intrusion on bodily sovereignty, our decisions to decide what happens to our body, who we want to have touch our body, and how we want our body to experience pleasure, right? Um, but when somebody assaults us or takes advantage of us, uh, our bodily sovereignty and autonomy are violated. So I see a very strong corollary between sexual assault um, survivors and tribal nations, and that all converges on native people who are survivors, right? So you're experiencing both the violation of bodily sovereignty, but you're also struggling within a tribal nation to be able to do something about it, right? Um, so that's how I sort of think about sovereignty in two different ways. And so what I've concluded through some of my research and in my book is that tribal nations had legal systems. A lot of people, you know, they realized that tribes had governments, but not necessarily legal systems. We didn't have courtrooms. We didn't have powdered wigs and gavels, right? But we had legal systems. We had ways of adjudicating things. We had a way of, um, of uh, resolving disputes within the tribal nation. But these systems have been significantly weakened. And so now it's really, really difficult in this day and age for a tribal nation to do something about sexual assault. And that's what I'm trying to change. The next slide I have describes a sexual assault in detail. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to put the slide up. If you do not wish to read it, you, you do not have to. It is graphic. And I'll let you know when I change the slide over. So one of the things that, you know, the big trend in the 90s, starting in the 90s, was to rethink Columbus Day, right? And rethink what Columbus Day represents. So one of the things that I like to remind people is that Columbus was not just a symbol of imperialism, he, he was actually a predator, right, of individuals. And so I share this passage, which came from the second journey in 1495, from one of his aristocratic friends who wanted to come and see the new world. And the very first thing that he did when he arrived in um, North American land was to rape a woman and feel no shame whatsoever. In fact, he bragged about it. So we, ha we have to understand federal Indian law and federal Indian history from this context of how sexual assault has become so embedded in the settler colonial state that it, there's no question why it is that Native people suffer such high rates of violence. Okay, I'm going to change the slide now. One of the other things that federal policy did is moved us around, and not by choice, right? Uh, most people have heard of the Trail of Tears, um, or the long walk, or other forms of forced migration. Um, the one I'm going to talk about is, is the one that affected my nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation. And as I mentioned earlier, we were largely in the Alabama and Georgia region. And you can see that it's not a single trail. It's a lot of trails. And I'll tell you this, there were a lot more than tears. There was death, murder, and rape. So what's happening during this time period is a lot of people think about, a lot of male historians who write about the Trail of Tears, they don't talk about sexual assault. But we know today that in any conflict zones, in any refugee status, right, that sexual assault is a really, really difficult and common experience that people um, go through. And so it's no wonder that when I got a book recently, a historian pulled almost every letter or document that was written about the Trail of Tears of my people, the Creek Nation, it's about this thick. And in every 10, 15, 20 pages, there's an account of a, a Muscogee woman or girl being raped by one of the soldiers on the Trails of Tears. So by the time we reached Indian country or Indian territory, um, we, we had lost many people. We had to bury babies, old people at the side of the road. We weren't given a chance to mourn um, and end up in Indian territory, um, not just being traumatized by the forced migration, but also by the kind of trauma that was imposed on those who lived and made it to Indian territory. But the Trail of Tears in the Southeast is not the only. Almost every tribal nation either resisted or in experienced uh, forced removal from their lands. This is a picture from the other side of the continent. This is a picture of some Diné women or Navajo women in the 1860s. Um, we don't know much about this picture. We don't know the names of the people in the picture, but we do know that these are Diné women and that they were imprisoned at a military fort when this picture was taken. And one of the things that strikes me about this picture every time I look at it is the, the trauma that I see in this picture. So again, we don't know exactly who they were or what they'd been through, but given that they'd just been on a very long forced march and were under complete control of the military, you have to wonder if those faces and eyes don't represent 
not just hunger and fatigue, but something even more sinister. People talk about land, and hashtag land back is all the rage right now um, among young Native scholars and activists. Everybody kind of knows this piece, right? <sighs> that the land was stolen, right? It was either uh, cheated, they cheated out of, um, or treaties that we didn't understand or treaties that were broken. There are many different reasons why Native people lost land. But I want to talk about it in the context of sexual violence because that, again, is not something we normally hear about. For many, many Indigenous people, solace and, and prayer come from a particular place. Not a church that you could go to a different church in a different state, but an actual landmark like a mountain or a stream or a river. And when you, when you were traumatized, you would go to those places. When you lose land, you lose access to those sacred sites. Right? You don't have access to the cliff or the mountain where your great-great-grandparents would have prayed in their times of difficulty. And so it, become, it becomes very difficult for, tri for many survivors to find that place of solace that their ancestors used when they were troubled. Um, and so I like to think about that, the loss of land in that context and the importance of returning sacred sites um, to, um, to tribal nations. There is an under, there's a developing movement right now to try to return at least partial control over national parks to tribal nations, something that is very exciting to me. Another federal policy I want to um, bring up is the boarding school era. I really like to call this time period the brainwashing era, uh, brainwashing era because in the late 19th century, um, Congress decided that it was becoming, frankly, too expensive to kill Indians. They actually discussed the budget on the floor for the War Department. The Indian Affairs Department of the federal government was originally in the War Department. And uh, they were sort of tallying up how much it was costing to kill an individual Indian. Um, and so they wanted to find a cheaper, faster way to deal with what they actually characterized as the Indian problem. The solution was proposed by a military um, academy uh, um, white man named Henry Pratt who said, look, we can just take these kids out of their community, teach them to be white, and then they will be white and we will not have an Indian problem anymore. So this picture is a lot of times these schools, again, and this period lasted from around 1880s to around the 19, late 1960s. So we have a lot of survivors of these boarding schools still with us. This was a picture taken, um, would have been in the 19th century. Um, you notice who took the picture here because the military was often tasked with rounding up children and taking them away. And these children are Apache children. They were taken from the southwest part of the United States to Carlisle, Pennsylvania to be brainwashed. This is the same group of children just about three months later. So I'll show you again this before and after picture. This is the same group of children. This is before and then after um, being forced thousands of miles from home without their parents, um, dressed in military uniforms and having their hair cut. And there's a lot of good scholarship on this issue now. A lot of survivors have spoken out. A lot of survivor scholars have spoken out about this time period. And certainly that was forced Christianity, right? You could be punished for actually speaking your tribal language. So I call them brainwashing institutions and not boarding schools. And um, the other part, you know, I'm always going to bring this up, as you've probably gathered, is that there was a lot of sexual abuse in a lot of these schools. And these children did not have anywhere to turn. There was no one to report it to. Uh, their parents were a 1,000 miles away. So um, you have to think again when I talk about how embedded sexual violence is in this ethic of sort of brainwashing children. Um, it, it makes sense that <laughs> this was the tactic, was to traumatize children to the point where they would no longer be proud to be who they were. So that's another example of how federal policy um, facilitated widespread sexual assault in Indian communities. Now, I'd like to, to, do, to do a pause here and tell you, you know, that we weren't just passive, silent victims of, of this kind of treatment. Um, I like to talk about Sarah Winnemucca, who's a Paiute woman who was the first Native woman to publish a book in the United States. It was a nonfiction book uh, called Life Among the Paiutes. 
Uh, it's in public domain, so for students that means free. <laughs> and you can get it on Google Books, so read it. Um, she talked about a lot of different things that her people were going through, the Paiute people in the Great Basin area. And um, it wasn't just a book about sexual assault, but she sure brought it up a lot because she was trying to educate wealthy, um, sort of woke <laughs> um, white liberals on the East Coast to give money to her so she could start a school for Paiute children that would be run by Paiute people. And so she, she made money off her book, she made money off speaking engagements, and um, is an example of the resistance and resilience of this time period, um, that it wasn't just about victimhood, it was also about um, claiming the truth and standing for the truth. So now I want to talk, I'm going to turn a little law professor on you here. I want to talk about three, well, two federal laws and one federal case um, that deal with the sovereignty issue, the sovereignty of tribal nations. So the first law I want to tell you about is called the Major Crimes Act. The Major Crimes Act is a law from the late 1800s, 1885. This was a really interesting time in American history because in the late 1800s, there were a lot of um, disagreements among and between Native people about what, did, what do we do at this point? Are we going to keep fighting? Or are we going to try to compromise? Are we going to try to make this work? Uh, and oftentimes that, that principle or the, the ethic behind that divided tribal people, divided whole tribes. Um, and this is an example of that kind of um, story. So Crow Dog is the man um, you see here on the left, and uh, his, his um, I'm not going to try to pronounce his traditional name because I haven't asked the appropriate people how to do it. Um, but he's known as Crow Dog, and then on the right is Spotted Tail, who was another um, Lakota chief in the same time period. And they had very different, they had a feud. Um, some say the feud involved mistreatment of women, but it's not really clear. And there are many, many descendants of both of these men living today. Uh, so I always get a little nervous about trying to tell the story because I'm sure there are differences of opinion about it. Um, but Crow Dog and Spotted Tail had a feud and, and uh, Crow Dog murdered um, Spotted Tail, with probably with the gun he's holding in that picture. And so the, the Lakota people of that region uh, decided to do something about it, a homicide, right? On tribal land, on the reservation, um, and they did that. And they, they went through an adjudicatory process as well as a restitution process. And um, the, the penalty or the sanctions for a crow dog was to provide all of the material goods for Spotted Tail's family for the rest of his life. So he wasn't put in prison, but he was held accountable, and he was held accountable under Lakota law. The federal agents in the federal um, or in the white community in this area um, were very unhappy with this outcome because they saw it as Crow Dog getting a pass on homicide. And they liked Spotted Tail, so they were really angry that they didn't see what they saw as justice happen here. So the federal government decided to prosecute Crow Dog on their own and um, filed federal charges against him, um, and he was found guilty and sentenced to hang, which is exactly what the white community wanted at that time. But Crow Dog had a really good lawyer, and they took this case all the way to the US Supreme Court. It's a case called Ex Parte Crow Dog. Actually, the Supreme Court uses the traditional name um, uh, in the actual US Supreme Court decision. And the question was, how does the federal government get power here? This is a, a, a Lakota community on a reservation. It's the land of the people. And everything that we're talking about happened within this reservation. So what, you know, it, it kind of like if, if France came over tomorrow and started prosecuting crimes. Uh, you don't have authority here. And so that's exactly what Crow Dog argued. He said, you don't have any, this is our sovereign reservation, our sovereign nation. You do not have any power here. And that's the argument he took to the Supreme Court, and believe it or not, he won. The Supreme Court wrote an opinion that, while it, it, it very, it's a very racist opinion in many ways, you know, admitted that Crow Dog had a really good argument. The federal government didn't have power here. This was a uh, Lakota community with Lakota laws and Lakota people, and the federal government lacked authority to prosecute him. So he won, and the very next thing Congress did 
was pass a law called the Major Crimes Act. And the Major Crimes Act actually reversed the US Supreme Court. So they said, okay, you said we need a law to give us power over reservations, so we're just gonna write it. And so <laughs> that's what we work with today on many, many reservations across the United States. There's some exceptions, but this is still good law today. And what it means is that when someone is assaulted, murdered, um, raped on an Indian reservation, it's actually the FBI who comes and investigates that crime. And if it's prosecuted, it's prosecuted by the United States attorneys in federal court. Now, tribes can also prosecute these crimes, um, but as you'll see, it's, there's other reasons it becomes difficult for tribes to, to take on these kinds of crimes. So um, the challenge has been that many federal prosecutors have not taken this part of their job very seriously. And even as of, I think, a couple of years ago, the GAO report said they, federal prosecutors decline to prosecute around 70 to 80% of the sexual abuse cases that come to their attention. So it hasn't really worked. In other words, the federal government gave themselves the power and then didn't exercise it. So predators know these things, right? People who, who harm others know these things. The second law I want to talk to you about is the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968, which sounds like a really good law. Uh, it's in the time period of the 60s. We have the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, a lot of things that we're still hearing about on the news today. But what the Indian Civil Rights Act did was not exactly the same thing as you saw in other civil rights. Here, what Congress was doing was trying to control tribal courts. They were concerned that tribal courts were not bound by the US Constitution, which is true. We didn't have a seat at the table. So tribal nations are not bound by the US Constitution. This really made a lot of uh, people in Congress really nervous. And so they basically created a Bill of Rights that would apply in tribal court. And it looks a lot like our Bill of Rights. There's a couple of exceptions, like we don't have, in ICRA, we don't have a, um, an establishment clause, which means that tribal nations can fund uh, churches and ceremonies. <clears throat> the other thing they did was put a, li a limitation on the sentencing authority of tribal courts. So at the time it was originally passed, the maximum penalty that the tribal court could impose on anyone was six months for anything, and that would include rape, murder, those kinds of things. Um, that was later changed to one year in um, the Reagan era so that we could prosecute drug crimes and put people away for longer, so think about that. Um, and so that's what we're left with today. Now we did get a fix, a little fix, um, a few years ago in the Violence Against Women Act, um, or I'm sorry, the Tribal Law and Order Act, which gives us three years per offense for anything including child sexual abuse and murder. Three years. Now, we'll come back to this, but the whole question of whether or not Anglo law and order and American style prisons are the right choice for Indian country is another question. And then finally, I wanna tell you about a Supreme Court case called Oliphant versus Suquamish, um, which was 1978, not, not 1878, 1978. I was five, I think, when this happened, so I didn't, I didn't know about it till law school. But um, what this essentially said, there were two white men who had caused a lot of problems on the Suquamish Reservation in Washington State, and they'd committed a series of crimes. Um, some people think they were kind of testing the system a little bit, but they argued you know, that the tribe prosecuted them for, for their dangerous behavior, and they took it to the Supreme Court and said, we do not sit on Suquamish juries, and we do not vote in Suquamish elections, um, so we shouldn't be held accountable by Suquamish juries. Now again, if we put that into any other context, it's a ridiculous argument. If I go to Missouri tonight and rob a liquor store, I don't get to show up in Missouri court tomorrow and say, well, I don't vote here, and I don't serve on juries here, so let me go. It would be you know, it would be laughed at, but they won. So as of 1978, tribal nations cannot prosecute non-Indians for any crime. Again, we've made some changes to this um, for domestic violence in the Violence Against Women Act, but um, still most crimes, with the exception of some domestic violence crimes, um, cannot be in tribal court, can't prosecute non-Indians. 
Now think back to that chart that I showed you early on, which you're probably like, why is she talking about interracial crimes? Most perpetrators of violence against Native people are non-Native. Why is that? Because tribes can't prosecute them? I think that's part of it. I mean, there are many, many factors. I'm a lawyer, so I think legal <laughs> answers. But there's many things going on here, not just the law. But um, that has really put um, Native people in danger. So by the end of the 20th century, we really have um, a quagmire for tribal courts. We can do very little, um, at least as far as what a Western system could do, right? So one of the things here that I, I like to talk about is you know, that na na tribal nations can create systems that don't mirror Western law and order and mass incarceration. And yet that's what we've been encouraged to do for so long, dating back in my tribe to the 1820s. That's what a lot of tribes do now, is they really act and, and serve as a kind of Western-style court. And I'm really interested in alternatives to that, but alternatives that still hold perpetrators accountable for their behavior. Right? I think accountability is a keystone, it's a touchstone for any system that wants to hold perpetrators accountable. You need accountability and you need victim services for the victim herself and her, his or her family. Okay, so that's what we're struggling with now. Um, there's also some, that, some folks that argue that there were no, nothing like a prison existed in pre-colonial times. Now, I'm not an archeologist, so I can't really tell you how they know that, but many people have commented on this in the literature. Um, we did execute people, some of our tribes did. Um, I'm not in any way supporting, you know, bringing back the death penalty, but just to give you an example of um, the kinds of penalties we did impose, but there was very little um, in terms of what we would actually call incarceration going on. So um, I wanna now turn to resilience, I'm almost done, um, and, and end on a good note. So um, I have had the opportunity over the years to work on both federal legislation to fix some of this mess, as well as filing briefs with the US Supreme Court on cases of, uh, of, of note that I'll tell you about here. So the whole idea of an amicus brief, and if you're following some of the issues in the news around the abortion cases, you may hear about amicus briefs. There are, there are, a brief essentially is a, is a legal document or a legal argument. I don't know why we keep calling them briefs because sometimes they're this thick. Um, but what we were able to do is, um, the, the amicus briefs allow um, someone who is not actually a party to the case to file a legal argument saying this is gonna impact me or our people in this particular way. So you're not actually getting in front of the court with your arguments, but you're filing at least a written document to make it, tell the court, tell this, the justices how this is not just gonna impact the parties, but how it's gonna impact others. And so we started doing this. Um, I work with a Cherokee attorney named Mary Catherine Nagel, and we have been filing briefs on behalf of, um, of, of Native people in the Supreme Court for about, um, oh gosh, I should know this off the top of my head. I wanna say about eight years we've been doing this. We had a case um, against Dollar General, you know, the Dollar General stores. So we, um, we intervened as an amicus, not intervened, that's not the right term, but we filed a brief in this case. This was a case between the Mississippi Band of Choctaw and the Dollar General store, the whole corporation. Let me tell you a little bit about um, what it, the story was. So um, the, the Choctaw, uh, the, there's two Choctaw nations, one is in, is in Oklahoma and one is in Mississippi. Um, the Mississippi Choctaw nation is a fairly, uh, relatively wealthier nation than, than, than what your average reservation is. They have, um, they have gaming, but they've also heavily diversified their economy. So they have a book plant, they have a book binding plant, a water bottling plant. They have a lot of different kinds of economic endeavors going on. And one of the things they have is a lot of retail establishments that uh, sign a lease, a business lease with the tribe. And a Dollar General store um, did that at the Mississippi Choctaw Reservation. Uh, they had a job opportunity program for Choctaw youth, and um, it was an opportunity for um, summertime, keep the kids off the street, um, have an opportunity to see what it's like behind the scenes at a real job. And so there was a young boy, Choctaw boy, placed 
with the Dollar General store, and fortunately he was molested um, by the white manager of that store. Um, and the federal government, which would have authority per the Major Crimes Act, um, didn't prosecute it because they didn't think it was serious enough because there was no penetration. So um, that left the family with, with no justice. So they decided to file a personal injury lawsuit in tribal court against the Dollar General Corporation, right? And the, at, the, the only thing you could get out of that is cash, right? So you could get money to pay for pain and suffering, you could get punitive damages, you could get um, medical bills, counseling bills, college tuition, right? All of the things that might have been taken from this child who's now about 30 years old, this happened quite some time ago. Um, and so they wanted to file this suit and they wanted to argue that Dollar General should have known that they hired somebody with a pro you know, proclivity to, to commit assault. Um, and the Dollar General Corporation, as you can imagine, with a number of stores, has got deep pockets. So they wanted to get justice for their son. And so they went to their tribal court to do it. Dollar General, the corporation, spent upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get out of tribal court. And they claimed that they couldn't get a fair shake, that the tribal jury would be biased against them with no evidence of such, right? They just said, well, the Mississippi Choctaw juries are not gonna be fair to our client because they're Indians, because they're tribal members. Um, that part they didn't get as specific about. But we decided to tell the court the story of victims of crime in Indian country through this amicus brief. Um, and it was a little bit different. This is a cover page. This is what the front of an amicus brief looks like. Um, we filed this brief and we said, look, you're not going to give us criminal jurisdiction. Give us civil, right? Because we, if you take civil too, we got nothing left. We can't get any accountability. We can't get any justice. Um, so please do not take away our civil authority as well. And in addition to writing the brief, we also staged demonstrations outside the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, you know, again, the, the justices aren't seeing this, but it was part of a public awareness campaign about the case. Um, we got a tie vote. So um, this was the year that Justice Antonin Scalia passed away. And uh, so we were left with eight justices. And it was a 4-4 tie which means we were one vote away from losing civil jurisdiction in the 21st century. Now, what happens when you have a tie vote is the lower court stands. The lower court had found in favor of the tribe, and so the, the lawsuit was able to commence in tribal court. But think about the hundreds of thousands of dollars that this corporation spent because they didn't think that tribal members could be fair, right? Took it all the way to the courts. Very expensive to do this. So um, we felt that we had a sort of victory because we didn't think we had a chance. So we started doing it in other cases too. And in every case that I've been able to write um, with Mary Catherine, the Cherokee attorney, um, we don't even know if the justices have read our briefs, right? Because they don't have to. They don't have to re respond to inquiries about that. But every single case so far that we have filed a brief in has won. Um, not necessary because of our arguments, but uh, we want to have a foot in the door. We want to be um, noticed by, by the U.S. Supreme Court. And I just got another case we're going to start working on next week um, about double jeopardy and sexual assault. So this is my way of finding strength and resilience in the work that I do, which is so distressing and so difficult to talk about. And so I want to talk a little bit about recognizing resilience because we have the tendency when we talk about social problems to see those problems, um, we can make the mistake of seeing those problems as identifying the community. So what I mean by that is that many people think about tribal nations, they don't think about uh, uplifting things. They think about poverty, they think about um, uh, suicides, they think about substance abuse, but they don't think about powerful nations, right? So I think it's really important that we talk about the good things that tribal nations are doing. In the same way, I think that survivors of assault should not be defined by the violence they experience. Sometimes it takes over. 
but it is not a lifelong brand, right? Um, and so survivors of assault who experience resilience and hope also deserve as much attention. And then, of course, families and friends of missing people and murdered people should be centered in the search and or resolution of the crime. And that's why I'm so glad that Jana's mother talked about the good things about Jana, not her murder, but all that she offered. And again, I wish I could have met her. Um, I have just one more slide, um, and this is the answer to the question that so many people ask me, which is, how do you do this? Isn't this depressing? Isn't this like just a bummer to work on every day? Yes, and I, couldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have it any other way. This is what I was born to do. So um, Joy Harjo is also Muskogee. She is the first Native Poet Laureate in the United States, and she is tremendously gifted with, um, with music and with poetry. Um, and so I, I really like one of her poems called The Fear Poem. And she was on, um, MTV used to have, what was that called, spoken word, um, something, I don't think they have it anymore, but she was on that, and she, she did this poem. Um, she said it's sort of magic to get rid of fear. It's a much longer poem than what I have here, but um, um, you can kind of see, so I draw some of my strength from poetry. I read a lot of nonfiction and a lot of poetry, and really not much fiction. <laughs> which I've been told is kind of an anti-intellectual thing to say, but it's, it's true. Um, so Joy, um, you know, her, her words stay with me. Um, all of the, the hard work that Native women have done um, and Two-Spirit people have done to raise awareness around this issue and to balance that very difficult um, issue of raising awareness about a harm but not being defined by it. That's a really hard thing to do, and it's a very fine line. So um, that's my story. Um, if you need to reach me um, here at KU, I also have a website um, and uh, Twitter. So I, I went off Twitter for a little bit for, for mental health reasons. And when I came back, they took my Twitter handle away from me. Um, so I'm starting again, uh, Sarah Deer 72 um, And I do um, post often uh, about these issues, but also some cute pictures. Have you guys ever seen pictures of a baby platypus? Oh my God, I just saw one for the first time the other day. They're called Puggles. And so I put that on my Twitter. <laughs> so it's like, I talk about, you know, federal cases and then Puggles. Um, but I really just couldn't be happier to be back at KU. This is my home. This is where I became who I am. Uh, and it is such an honor to be part of this kind of event. Um, and I just, like I said, sitting down with Sarah Jane and talking about RVSS and the hard work that Jana did, um, that we just missed each other in the night. I, I got here in 93, left in 99, and, and so missed her just by a couple of years. But it's um, thank you for allowing me to speak in an event in her honor, uh, and thank you all for, for listening to me tonight. I really appreciate it.